Greetings, everyone. As usual, I'm your host, Jared Taylor, from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. In this video, I will continue our Chemistry for Biology topics by introducing you to non-covalent interactions. Before we start, I should mention that the concepts in this video build directly upon the concepts I introduced in the previous video on electronegativity. And, like electronegativity, some of this may be review for you. Nonetheless, I recommend watching that video before this one. Anyway, let's get on with it. What are we talking about when we say non-covalent interactions? Well, these are the interactions between any two molecules, or sometimes between different groups on the same molecule, that do not directly involve the covalent sharing of electrons. Non-covalent interactions allow molecules to attract each other and, quote unquote, stick together although keep in mind they aren't truly stuck together. And let me just stress this now, as we will undoubtedly stress it in class. Despite how insignificant non-covalent interactions may seem at first, I cannot overstate just how important they are in biochemistry, biology, and life. In fact, almost every aspect of biochemistry is only possible due, in no small part, to non-covalent interactions. Please keep that in mind. These types of interactions break down into three broad categories that we will summarize as induced dipole interactions, permanent dipole interactions, and ionic interactions. Conveniently, each of these overarching types is generally associated with a type of bond introduced in the electronegativity video. Induced dipole interactions generally involve nonpolar bonds. Permanent dipole interactions generally involve polar bonds and ionic interactions involve ionic bonds, although we will simplify that and say they generally involve ions. So let's talk about each type of interaction individually, and for no particular reason I will start with the permanent dipole interactions. Permanent dipole interactions involve polar bonds, such as the one found in the acetone molecule shown here, and for simplicity I will convert the acetone into its skeletal form. The carbon-oxygen double bond has a sizable dipole, as we can see by looking at the electronegativity values. The carbon atom has an electronegativity of 2.55, while the oxygen has a value of 3.44. Subtracting one from the other and taking the absolute value gives us a difference of 0.89, which, if you recall from the electronegativity video, puts this double bond firmly in the polar bond region of the spectrum. In other words, this double bond has two poles, one partially positive and the other partially negative. And since the partial charges are fixed on the atoms, the acetone molecule has a permanent dipole. So what happens if we have two acetone molecules? Well, the permanent dipoles act like tiny magnets, with the partial positive of one acetone attracting the partial negative of the other. This creates a rather strong attraction between the two molecules. Because this is two permanent dipoles interacting, we would classify this specific interaction as a permanent dipole to permanent dipole interaction. Okay, great. Let's try another type of interaction based on the induced dipole. Let's imagine we have a molecule comprising only carbon and hydrogen bonds, as shown here. Again, I will simplify things with a skeletal structure. This molecule has a bunch of electrons orbiting around and since electrons are both particles and waves, we generally think about them as a cloud of electron density surrounding the molecule. Since the electrons are mobile, they don't have to be evenly distributed within the molecule. This means that for a brief moment in time, the electrons may actually be more concentrated on one side of the molecule than the other. But what is the result of this happening? Well, as you know, electrons are negatively charged, and so when an imbalance occurs, it creates a very weak and very temporary dipole. Okay, cool, so what? Well, imagine that a second molecule is sitting nearby, and for this I will remove the electrons to keep it clean. In this situation, we now have a weak partial negative dipole approaching the second molecule. The electron cloud in the second molecule will try to move away from the partial negative charge since negatives repel negatives. This causes the second molecule to adopt its own weak dipole. In other words, the weak dipole of the first molecule induced a weak dipole in the second. As you can imagine, 
the second molecule can now do the same to its other neighbors, and then they can do the same to other molecules, and so on. Anyway, back to these two molecules. Because they now both have a weak dipole in the correct orientation, they can interact and attract each other. This specific type of interaction is referred to as an induced dipole to induced dipole interaction since all the molecules are inducing each other. Note that because these dipoles are not fixed, they only last for a fraction of a moment in time before the electrons rearrange themselves and other induced dipoles emerge. This results in individual induced dipole-based interactions being very weak, although, as you will see in this course, they can be very strong in great numbers. And that brings us to the ionic interactions. These are quite easy to understand. Essentially, if we have two molecules that each have a full charge of opposite polarity, they will strongly attract each other. This is known as an ion-to-ion -ion interaction, although we often just simply call it an ionic interaction. As non-covalent interactions go, an ion-to-ion -ion interaction is the strongest type you will encounter. So that summarizes the three general types of interactions. There is one last thing to mention, however. What I have shown you so far are the uniform non-covalent interactions, that is, two induced dipoles, two permanent dipoles, or two ions interacting with each other. However, the types can be mixed. As an example, a permanent dipole can induce a dipole in another molecule and interact with it, as shown here. This would be referred to as a permanent dipole to induced dipole interaction. In fact, any of the three general types of interactions can be mixed, resulting in three non-uniform types of non-covalent interactions as shown here. You will see and work with all of these quite a bit here in Biology 112. I should also mention that a molecule can use all of the different types of interactions at the same time to interact with its neighbors, rather than just one type. Finally, there is another type of non-covalent interaction known as the hydrogen bond, but it is so incredibly important in biochemistry that it deserves its own video. For now, let me wrap this up. Hopefully this video has given you some insight as to what non-covalent interactions are. As you will see in class, they are used everywhere in biology and biochemistry. In the next video, I will continue the discussion of non-covalent interactions by introducing you to the hydrogen bond.